You know, I think it's kind of ironic. I just, the other day I did a 10 mile circle. I was not doing it for any particular reason, but uh, I happened to go over on 36 and came around. I went west a little bit. I came back and I ran around back, back road back to my place. And Mike, how many things did I drive by? I went by the Effigy uh, Mounds over there. Yep. I went by, there's some trail uh, indications there, but more over there I went by. There's the uh, agency site, yeah. Kerwin agency site, murder site, the assassination site of uh, of uh, Golden Day and Younger, mm -hmm. uh, over by the bridge. I went by the sawmill. I went by the confluence, if you would, of the Leech Lake Trail and the Red Lake uh, uh, Red River Trail. Well, I was in the village gap the entire time, so. Uh, I just think it's interesting to see that much history all crowding together in one place, and we're going to get some real detail tonight. So, uh, anything else I need? If you get cold, let me know, and I'll shut some windows. I thought normally we get too hot. Do you remember it was 90 degrees when we were here? <laughs> yeah, I thought you did. So, I'm going to introduce uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Jackson. Jeremy Jackson is a Brainerd native. Had an early history, early interest in history, I should say. Um, historical researcher, genealogist, lecturer, writer. Did that cover everything? Pretty much. Uh, he's a volunteer for the Brainerd History Week Steering Committee, coordinator of the Paul Bunyan Land, uh, Paul Bunyan Land Cultural and Historical Society. Been writing a book now on uh, some of the collaborations he had. We mentioned, we mentioned uh, Doug Burke earlier again. I worked with Doug Burke a lot in collaboration on some of the things on the railroads, particularly the logging railroads. He's got a book coming out on that. He's also working on a book for the 1872 Blueberry Wars, which was an event that happened in Brainerd, correct? 1872. 1872. Now residing in Egan. So I want to introduce to you and please welcome our speaker for the night, Jeremy Jackson. And thank you, Dave, for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? So, real briefly on my family history, uh, my great-grandfather, my mom's side, and her dad worked at the railroad shops in Brainerd. Actually, my grandfather's in the white rectangle, and just to his right is my great-grandfather. I also had three uncles that retired from the shops, and I had a cousin working there as well. My dad worked at the paper mill in Brainerd for 35 years. And my dad's dad was the head mining engineer for Hanna Mining in the Cuyuna Range until 1967. So he came from Hibbing originally as a mining engineer in Hibbing with Oliver Mining Company. So I got a lot of family history and roots here. Uh, obviously a lot of railroad roots as well, but it's really my grandmother, my mom's mom, that got me interested in history as a young child, going through the Brainerd History book, the Centennial book. Uh, I looked at that with her, on her lap. And so I encourage you, if you have children, grandchildren, talk to them about um, local history and get them excited about it because there's a lot of and again I want to thank Dave for putting this together all right so you're gonna see the yellow dot in here I gotta find the pointer that's us so I'm going to have that in almost every map tonight so you know where we're at compared to what we're showing this is where I grew up on the east side of White Sand Lake my parents bought their house here in 1971 uh, they had it there for almost 30 years so this really is my backyard as well my brother Bob has a house here at South of Pillager, just across the river off of one. So you, many of you might know Bob and Tina Jackson. Um, Tina's parents are, are Arlene and the late Gary Schmidt. And of course, we're gonna talk about Gull River tonight, but we're gonna talk about a lot of other things tonight as well and how Gull River fit into not just the Pillager Gap, but into the Midwest. But before we do that, give me just a second. We're gonna talk about LIDAR and show a lot of LIDAR imagery tonight. Some of you may not have seen LIDAR before. I'm gonna give you LIDAR in a nutshell. The state of Minnesota takes an airplane with thousands of lasers and they point it at the ground, they fly over and it penetrates the foliage and you could take a picture of the earth without the trees, without the brush. And then the software also eliminates old buildings. So it's like if you have a very hairy dog and you take it in for surgery and they shave its ribs, you can see its ribs for the first time. So you can see a lot of LiDAR imagery tonight. Not just the Gull River, but we're going to take a step back and I'll show, show you some things from the previous presentations over the next five minutes. So for example, 
Uh, obviously, we're right down here at the Sylvan Town Hall. This is a lighter image. This is called Gray Shade Relief. You can see the uh, gravel pit. Uh, the lake shore pops out. We're going to cover, the, there's Indian mountains here, obviously, which I'm sure you talked about previously. Uh, I'll show you a close up of those in just a few moments. Um, briefly, again, the Pillager Gap. Just in terms of the route, for hundreds and thousands of years, the Pillager Gap was a transportation route for large herds of animals, antelope, um, elk, bison, and because of that you also have human traffic through here. So for hundreds if not thousands of years the Native Americans also used this as a major transportation route. And then later on as technology advanced then the ox cart path came through here, the trail came through here, then uh, the railroad came through here, and then also later the highway. So this is an image that I'm going to show you in light in just a moment of the Pillager Gap. Now the, the green here is the pines and the moraines. And the gap of course is right here, the yellow dot is us. This is what LiDAR looks like with the Pillager Gap. Now it's not as good as I'd hoped because it's a little bright in here. But you can see actually the glacial uh, scrapes on the moraines. And here's the Pillager Gap right here. Brainerd's here, Gull Lake, North Long, Crowing State Park, and then the South Moraine. And I'll show you a close up. Here's a little bit closer view. Again, here's the Pillager Gap. The town of Pillager is here. We're here. You got the highway and the, the main line of the railroad that goes right through the Pillager Gap. The moraines would have been just too difficult for the railroad to go through, which we'll talk about later. Gull River Village is here. And then, of course, Gull River and the Crowing River. This again is gray shaded. This is my preference for LiDAR. What's great about the gray shaded relief is you can change the angle of the sun or the light. And by doing that, sometimes you see things that you can't see with one angle versus the others. Again, here's Pillager, Pillager Gap, where we're located. And I have Red Sand Mount, Lake Mounds on here. I'll show you that in just a moment here. So I am the sixth and final presenter for the Pillager Gap series, History in Your Backyard. I know that Brian talked about, Brian Hargrave talked about the glaciers and the impact. So has anybody in the room att attended all five previous presentations? We've got quite a few. I don't know if they use LiDAR in all of them or some of them. I heard one perhaps. But I'll show you just a quick snapshot from each one of those uh, samples of those other presentations. So here's Little Red Sand Lake. Again, there's a lot of pine trees and hardwoods. This is what LiDAR does. It takes the trees away and you see the elongated Indian mounds or burial mounds. And unfortunately, uh, before they were protected, there were actually roads built through them and some of them were bulldozed. If you do anything now, you're going to get a felony, so don't don't ever tamper with an Indian mound. I know that um, Mike North talked about the early non-natives. He talked about Fort Ripley. So here's an image of Fort Ripley, which I'm sure was in his presentation. This is what the area looks like now, just in aerial photography. The trees kind of outline where the fort was located. But what's really neat was you do LiDAR, you see all the cellar indications of the fort. So Ron Miles was here um, two presentations ago in August, and he talked about the Oxcar Trail. Uh, my favorite sections of the Oxcar Trail are, are to the east and west of Fisherman's Bridge. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time with this slide before I move on. Uh, the Oxcar Trail is here, and it comes on this embankment. It must have forded the river somewhere here, and then there's evidence of it here. It's harder to see in this particular slide, but it's off the end of this power line. So when it came around here, there's a, there's a knoll right here. And I know in the presentation on the 1862 U.S. Dakota, Dakota War, I'm sure he talked about hole in the day and potentially the Chippewa joined in the Sioux during that quote unquote uprising. Um, well, I really won't include any history on this slide with the, with the U.S. Dakota War. What's interesting is that this knoll right here overlooks what used to be a very large prairie. And now it's flooded, of course, with the reservoir. And based upon descriptions on proximity to the Chippewa Agency, 
where the ox cart comes around the corner right outside a knoll that's been dug into now with the road. That's probably where Hole in the Day, the younger, was assassinated by the Leech Lake Indians. Now, I know that I heard someone mention, was it you? Did someone else do independent research on this that uh, had re previously identified this location? Because I, I had pinpointed this about a year ago and I was writing an article. Has someone else collaborated this before? I believe it would be right near this knoll on the west side of Gull, Gull River, based on the descriptions in the newspaper of Charles Ruffy and Gus Aspinwall. They were the first two to find Hole in the Day's body after the assassination. So I need to talk about the Northern Pacific Railroad. I know that it, next year, uh, potentially, if you have this series again, that the railroads will come into play, but we can't talk about Gull River without talking about the Northern Pacific Railroad, especially in relation to the Pillager Gap. So the Pacific Railroads Act of 1862 was signed by Abraham Lincoln on July 1st of that year. But the Northern Pacific, which was one of the three railroads that was founded by this act, the other being the Southern Pacific, actually the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific, were all transcontinental railroads. Um, it's really important to figure out why did it take so long before the railroads were actually built? Well, there's two reasons. Number one was money. Jay Cook came along in the late, late 60s. But there was another reason. So again, the Pillager Gap is right here. And I mentioned before that you really couldn't build a substantial railroad through the moraines. It's just too difficult a country, and it's going to be repeated again later in my, or my, my presentation tonight. So the railroad really had to get through the Pillager Gap, but there was one issue. So can anybody identify what this pink area is north of the junction of the Crow Wing and Mississippi River, what that would signify? David, by chance? It's a Gull Lake Indian Reservation. So the railroad probably legally couldn't build through the reservation, and it was the 1867 Indian Treaty that opened up the Pillager Gap to the railroad that had to happen essentially first. It may have had something to do with that negotiation. I'm not sure of this, but this is something I was looking at this past week, and uh, it's not something I've ever heard another historian think about. But it had to occur uh, for the railroad to build through here, which basically, was the eastern edge of the Pillager Gap. The 1867 Chippewa Treaty uh, organized the White Earth Reservation and forced the removal of the Gull Lake Chippewas in 1868, two years before the railroad was built. And again, here's uh, a map of northern and central Minnesota Chippewa reservations. This is the Gull Lake Indian Reservation. The western edge would have been right at the Pillager Gap. This is an early map of the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, the railroad historians of Minnesota believe that this bow from Duluth down to Fargo was intentional so that when they built from St. Paul eventually, it would have a shorter route. But the only reason it's bowed like this, 25 miles to the south, is to get through the Pillager Gap. And that Pillager Gap dictated where it crossed the river, which basically means that's why Brainerd was founded where it was at. It's because the Northern Pacific always planned to build their headquarters where the railroad was going to cross the river. But the only place that makes sense was due east of here. So really, the Pillager Gap may have heavily impacted where Brainerd is today. All right, let's get to Gull River. I think we all know where this is at. So let's talk about Gull River Village. So I'm not going to read through this in detail. Uh, the presentation, I understand, will be online here in a couple weeks, potentially. Um, the key thing I want to point out here is that the name of the presentation isn't the Gull River Lumber Company. It's the Gull River Lumber Companies, because the name changed almost every other year while it was here. But it was always the same group of owners. It was Jonathan Chase, George Pillsbury, John Pillsbury, Charles Pillsbury, August Hoare, and R.C. Levitt. The first name of the lumber company was the Chase Pillsbury & Company. It was formed in 1879. Later that fall, they started building the sawmill for the first time. 
By the next year, they already had over 150 people living in Gull River. Literally, the town sprang into existence in about nine months. By the next spring, they already were sawing logs in the sawmill and working in the lumber yard. Roughly at its peak, about 150 men worked in the sawmill. Um, the town had about 300 people total at, at its peak. Then in 1880, in May of 11th, a new lumber firm under the name of C.A. Pillsbury and Company was organized, consisting, consisting of the same investors, the assets of the Gulf River Village, and their pine lands. And then in 1882, then the name Gull River Lumber Company happened. Again, same investors, same assets, same lumber lands. Not sure why they kept changing names, but Gull River Lumber Company stuck for the most time, for about nine years. This is a picture of ex-Governor John Pillsbury, Charles Pillsbury, and then the site of Gull River. We're gonna spend a lot of time here in just a few moments. So I do have about 10 or so pictures of the village itself. I'm gonna just describe what the angles are so you understand what we're looking at. This particular angle is looking south across what today is Gull River, even today, a very a substantial waterway. Highway 210 would be in the foreground. Of course, the bridge is not there yet, but the Northern Pacific Railroad, the first trestle is still there. You can see the sawmill almost looks like it's in the river here. And then a bunch of the um, office structures and dwelling structures up on the ridge. This would have been on the south side of the, the railroad tracks to get a you know, bearing of where this was located at. This image is looking west from the east side of Gull River. The river is down in the shallow valley. We're going to talk about this boarding house quite a bit tonight. It'll be reappearing in the presentation. The Cunningham House, which is still standing, is right here. Of course, the sawmill and the lumber yard, and there's some dwelling structures here. The school would have been to the south and the west side of the river, or the east side of the river. The main line of the NP is just to the right here. You can't see it behind the structures. This is a great photo. Uh, I was told that a photograph of this, the Gull River Northern Pacific Depot does not exist. This was recently discovered in the Nisswa Historical Society. I think it's been returned to Crowing County Historical Society. At least the end of the depot building is there. Uh, it was rumored that this depot building was brought to Sylvan after Gull River was abandoned, but that's not the case. The dimensions don't match unless they rebuilt it from materials. This is very early. This is Chase Pillsbury and Company. That's the name that only stuck for about a year. So this had to be taken right around 1880 to 1881. And this side track going up here is the uh, mill track. The sawmills, this direction, this is looking east, southeast with the main line here. There was another track here, a siding of the Northern Pacific. This is an image looking a little bit north of west from the east side of the river. This is the only photo that shows the old company dam that made this a mill pond. The, deep, the trestle for the Northern Pacific is here. This is the sawmill and then a rugged, wagged bridge. Um, there's a woman with two children. She's carrying one and a young uh, boy uh, she's holding hands with. And yes, this is an outhouse and it's out over the river. So very good sanitation. This is a 1939 aerial of the village site. Uh, the sawmill would be in the water today. We'll talk about that later. The, most of the structures were along here. This wagon road was put in sometime after the village abandoned. This was used until 210 was put in, or this bridge on the north side, which was in 210. You can still see this old section of road in the woods to the north of 210. 210 is more in the marshy area. But I know this was post um, Gull River Village when it was in its heyday. F.J. Haynes was a Northern Pacific official photographer hired by the Northern Pacific and Brainerd in 1877. While he was in the area, he did take some pictures of Gull River. This is one of the best views of the, the actual sawmill. This is taken from the trestle looking south. You can see how low the sawmill is in proximity to the river, and all of the, the stacked lumber that goes for probably hundreds of yards to the south. Another image by F.J. Haynes. This says Gull River Lumber Company, or the office of the Gull River Lumber Company, so this was later. This is after 1882, and again, the sawmill's down here. This is looking south. He's probably standing near the main line of the Northern Pacific. 
And then there's numerous group shots taken over the course of Gull River's existence of the mill employees. Uh, I just wish they would have wrote down all the employees' names. I'm certain my wife's, uh, some of her family members were there. Uh, a lot of farmers worked there early in the spring, sawing lumber. They came from Crow Wing, from Motley, from south of Brainerd, uh, including right around here as well. Any questions about any of the Gull River photos before I move on? Feel free if you do have questions or if you want to look at an image. What, what year was this picture taken? Sometime after 1882 and before 1891, or before 1892, so nine, nine year window. Yes. Same family. And the same reason you have Pillsbury State Forest. And this is an image of the, the massive lumberyard to the west from the roof of the sawmill. Here are some of the boarding houses and office buildings. The main line of the NP would be here. Uh, the massive stacks of lumber and the loading dock. These are the side tracks coming off the main line that turn to the south. All right, so I want to talk just briefly about the primary markets for Gull River lumber. And really, it was everything west of here. Western Minnesota, North Dakota, and Montana. There was known distribution yards that I found in newspapers in Wapaton, North Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota, and Sanborn, but I'm sure they had uh, other retail outlets they were selling their lumber through, including in Fargo. So I'm going to deviate here just for a moment. So, when I was a senior in high school at Brader High School, my brother Bob, who's not here tonight, he lives in Pillager, he was going to North Dakota State and I was trying to determine where to go to school at, so I went and visited him as I was checking out North Dakota State University and ultimately I went there as a freshman. And he said, well, I got really good news if you consider this school. And I said, okay, what's that? He said, well, as a single 18-year-old bachelor, there's a single woman for every tree in North Dakota. This is a picture of Fargo from the roof of the headquarters hotel shortly after it was founded. And you can see there's absolutely no trees in North Dakota. If it hadn't been for the railroads, North Dakota would never have been settled unless you wanted to live in a sod hut the rest of your life. So it, the railroads were absolutely instrumental in settling uh, all the communities west of here. This is the headquarters hotel in Fargo where the photo was taken from. This is looking west. The previous photo was looking southwest. You can almost see Nebraska from here. <laughs> this is looking west towards Bismarck. And this is a railroad commission map of North Dakota. It's hard to see from your seats. This is a 1913 map, but the towns in North Dakota are only founded on the rail lines. There's no towns outside the rail lines. So all that lumber had to come from somewhere, and it didn't come from North Dakota. So this is the Northern Pacific here. Bismarck is here. Fargo is here. Wapitans here and Sanborn's here. So we know they had an um, outlet here at Sanborn, at Bismarck, and down at Wapiton, and I'm certain they had uh, distributors in Fargo for their lumber as well for Gull River. This is a picture of Bismarck again. It just shows how devoid of trees North Dakota was in the 1870s. So we talked about where the finished lumber went, but where did the timber come from? So the logs that supplied the sawmill were initially cut within very close proximity to all the waterways. So the chain of lakes of Gull Lake, uh, which included obviously Round Lake, all the chain lakes of the north, as far north as Sibley Lake and Pequot, which was connected by a tributary to Gull Lake. And then also we had uh, at least two streams that they used, Home Brook and Stony Brook. And this shows the Gull Lake watershed. In the chain of lakes, Sibley Lake is here in Pequot. There was a, there's a creek that flows between there and, and Upper Gull. And so anything within a mile of the lake was logged uh, with horses, skidding, sledding, etc. This was the logging dam that was used on Gull Lake by the um, Gull River Lumber Company. This is an exact same location that the dam is built today. That one, this one was placed in 1912 with a concrete dam. And to prove it was built in the same spot, there's the same bank in the background of the 1892 photo, April 1892 photo, and a current photo by Carl Faust he sent me. Perfect fingerprint. 
This is Stony Brook, about five miles from Upper Gull Lake. I'm going to show you in LIDAR a couple of logging dams. Doug Burke extensively studied the logging dams um, since the 60s. Um, these are two really, really prime examples. So you can see the earthen berms here, the burrow pits. What they would do is they would, if there was a gate, close the gate, let this fill up in the spring with all the logs, and then they either open the gate or dynamite the dam, and all the logs would flush down the stream, and they had a series of these dams. There was numerous dams on all these, all these creeks. Eventually, though, the accessible lumber near the waterways was impossible to get to, and it was too far to continue to use horse and, or horses and ox. So the, the Gull River um, Lumber Company decided, well, let's, let's experiment with what they're doing out east and in Michigan and Wisconsin and Maine. Let's try shipping logs by rail. So they began construction on a logging railroad in 1889 during the summer. Can you imagine being in the thick woods with mosquitoes building railroad grades with the, uh, the heat and the humidity and doing this? So when they started constructing this logging railroad, it was one of the first two in the state. I think it was building at the same time as another one was building out by Cloquet. But this was the only one ever built that was a narrow gauge logging railroad. The first two locomotives were bought secondhand from Michigan. Some of the rails were secondhand, some of the, the steel. What was really unique about this railroad, more so than even being narrow gauge, is that it was an isolated railroad. What I mean by that, it didn't connect to any of the railroads. It actually was built from Lake Margaret. If you know where Lake Margaret is, it's about a mile, mile and a half to the southwest of Zorba's restaurant. That was the headquarters. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. So you can imagine the challenge of bringing locomotives, rail cars, very, very heavy rail, up the hill to the lake, then across the lake and then to Lake Margaret and build a railroad from there. It had to be just an a impossible task with very the technology we don't have today. So the red dot represents Lake Margaret and where the log landing was located on Gull Lake. You can see this heavy green area. This is the moraines. Again, the Pillager Gap is down here. And the moraines even today still have heavy pine on those. This is a April 1892 uh, photo of the log landing on, on Lake Margaret. This is the narrow gauge landing. You can see it's the, what I mean by narrow gauge is that the tracks are three feet apart. Standard gauge is four foot eight inches or four foot eight and a half inches. So it's much narrower than a standard gauge rail line. This is the headquarters of the railroad, this office building here. If anyone knows Lauren Knack, he's a realtor in Brainerd, has been for years. When he and his wife moved here from Faribault, they bought a resort and that was their house. And when they tore it down, there was one sheet of newspaper as their insulation. He talked about having frost on the inside of their walls. But he actually lived in that building and this picture was taken in 1892. A lot of these other buildings were um, later incorporated into Portview Resort, which was a resort that the McClintocks purchased, I think, in 1921. And they used many of those buildings for their resort buildings. This is a image of almost the same angle, but the photographer was up on this hill, which is now heavily wooded, looking to the south and the, the railroad grade for the log linings up under the trees. Difficult to see. This photo is taken from the opposite angle, looking north towards the channel. Um, this was the second company steamboat. This boat was built in 1891. It was called the Flora. Uh, it was built specifically for the Gull River Lumber Company. And it's possible, which we'll talk about later, that that's Henry or Casper Mills is the pilot of that boat. Um, I can't imagine booming all those logs to the channel then all the way down the lake to the company dam. It had to be very expensive just to, to handle that transportation method. And just to show you that this is the same hill in the background as this photo here. This is a photo that's never been published before. Um, I don't know if, Collie, you've even seen this before. Um, this shows the west side of Lake Margaret at the log landing a year after the railroad abandoned. The narrow gauge only operated from 1889 to 1892. I'll cover the reason why in a little bit. But what's interesting in this photograph, as you can see the uh, headquarters building, these four cottages are where the locomotive engineer stayed. This was a hotel slash dining room for everybody else a farm, there's a root cellar here, 
and probably a warehouse for um, the lumbermen. Uh, what's interesting about this photo is this is the back end of an engine shed uh, on the shore of the lake. It's no longer there, and there's houses and cabins along here. That's something just to show Cully. Again, I don't think you've seen that before, Cully. Uh, to give you this example, um, I'm going to show you where some of the grades were close to Gull Lake, but not further out, out west. Uh, in the white rectangle here, it is represented by this. This is where the log landing was on Lake Margaret, and then the main line going into the pine forest. And once it got there, they branched everywhere like an oak tree. And went up to Spider Lake. Not the narrow gauge. The standard gauge did. We'll get to that in a minute. The, the narrow gauge never got that far. Okay. So this is the three locomotives of the narrow gauge, the Gull Lake and Northern Railroad. The first two locomotives were secondhand locomotives. They were purchased from Michigan. Uh, this is a Lima Shea, it's a geared engine. This is a brand new engine that was purchased new from Lima Shea. We'll cover that in just a moment. These locomotives can go up inclines up to 12%, whereas most railroads don't like 1%. Again, that's a reason why a railroad shouldn't build in the moraines because there's too many ups and downs, and it's very expensive to build through there. But these could handle it very, very well. This is an early Baldwin uh, rod engine. That was, well, I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, this is a close-up, actually of the cabin of the first Lima Shea, and this is one of the important citizens of Gull River. He moved here in 1880 with his brother Lee Hallett, and uh, he was with the railroad when it was the Gull Lake and Northern, when it was the Brainerd Northern, when it was the M&I, and he was, he was so senior that he pulled the first train into every depot that was ever built on the M&I. So as the railroad extended north from Brainerd to Walker to Bemidji to North Home to uh, Black Duck and then eventually to International Falls, he pulled the first train into every one of those depots. That's Cy Hallett. What's interesting here is that he's got a dog and then his daughter, Mabel Jean Hallett, and I interviewed her granddaughter about five years ago before she passed away. And she brought up something to me which I didn't realize, and she goes, when I used to visit my grandmother in Brainerd, she used to have an old trunk with all the family photos, and there was some China dolls in there. Well, what's interesting is she's got a China doll in her hand. And it's just like ironic that she brought that up, or coincidentally, she brought that up about the China dolls, and her grandmother has a China doll in the photograph. This is the rod engine. This is a photo taken in Michigan before 1889, showing that, that Baldwin rod engine uh, in Michigan, on use in a narrow gauge there before it was sold to the Gull River Lumber Company. This is the brand new Lima Shea locomotive. This is just coming into the, deep, the landing. Again, you can see the narrow gauge tracks. What's really interesting about this is there was no air brakes on these, on these trains. So there was brakemen stationed throughout the train and there would be probably some sort of whistle or ringing of a bell or something to signal to them when to apply the brakes and when to take them on or, turn, or take them off. And as hilly as some of these grades were, it was probably like riding a roller coaster, plus you had the back and forth of very poor ballast. In addition, Bad weather, icy conditions, the brakemen were falling off at a pretty heavy pace and getting killed. And there's numerous articles about brakemen getting killed on these trains west of Seagull Lake. Very dangerous occupation. This is, um, again, an April 1892 photo of the narrow gauge. The reason why so many of these, these grades were hard to find, and Doug Burke, um, that I know his name gets brought up again and again, he's an archaeologist and a dear friend of mine. Cullen's good friend from high school. Um, he spent over 50 years studying these grades, and Cullen was there most of the time with him in the field. Um, it's hard to find a lot of these grades because they're now underwater, because they built a lot of these loading areas in these low-lying marshes. And I told Doug years ago it would be really a hoot to find out where was this picture taken. Well, we used LiDAR and we figured it out, and we recreated the photograph. This is actually the same marsh. And this is actually on the railroad grade. It goes into the water underneath here. Again, there's the old photo. This is Doug Burke, myself, and a nearby landowner looking at the photo and comparing it to what we have here. You got the same bank in the background. No other marsh matched this, so it was perfectly a glass slipper, for lack of a better term. And there's kind of a mashup of the two images. Uh, I talked earlier about some important citizens of the village. I'm only going to cover three tonight. One of those was Cy Hallett. Another one, I stumbled into this by accident, uh, going through newspaper records for the railroad, 
This is an obituary for a Henry Mills. And what was interesting about this, he died a motley of a heart attack. He had a, um, I think he had both a hardware store as well as a meat market there. But it says here for 10 years, he was in Motley, but he also managed the extensive interest of the Gull River Lumber Company at Gull River. So it was true, I did learn this in the family, that Henry Mills was the manager of the Gull River Lumber Company here for the Pillsbury family and, and the other investors. Does anybody know who Henry Mills is? Got an answer in the back corner. His grandson is Stuart Mills Sr., who, who founded Mills Sleet Farm. That's correct. His son Casper and Henry were both also um, steamboat captains part of the time from what I've read and heard from the family. Anybody know who this is? This is the most important resident or historical resident probably of Sylvan Township. John, you know who this is. Charles Kindred. So Charles Kindred had one of the very, very, very first resorts in the area on Sylvan Lake. And that was as early as the 1870s. He was also a land agent for the Northern Pacific. He didn't have a great reputation with a lot of people, even today. But he's one of the most important historical figures in Brainerd. I'm going to cover some of these quickly, maybe just two of them. His actions really led to the demise of the Gull River Village and the sawmill here. Here's why. He built a dam in Brainerd that produced electricity. And why is that important? Well, because it made a really, really nice mill pond called um, Rice Lake in Northeast, in Northeast Brainerd. Again, uh, this will be online in the next couple weeks versus me reading through every one of the lines and things that he did in Brainerd. The Brainerd Dam was completed in March 1888. Again, that's before even the narrow gauge was built. So this is still four years before Gull, Gull River Village disappeared. Uh, it was planned to be 20 feet tall and produce 25,000 horsepower. It was originally planned to be located where Tyrell Hills is, where the old super value is, if you're familiar with that location. Uh, <coughs> is it Hardware Hank still there? One of the hardware stores? Ace. Ace, thank you. Lakeland Public Television. There you go. <laughs> thank you. It meant, again, I mentioned that Rice Lake was turned into an excellent mill pond. And while the dam was projected to produce 25,000 horsepower, it didn't raise the water level high enough, so it was essentially a, a failure when it came to producing the amount of electricity that they projected. Uh, we do have some pictures of the building of the dam. It is pertinent to Gull River, and I do apologize. We're kind of getting away from that. But I'm going to show you in a few minutes that Northeast Brainerd really could be called New Gull River for a lot of reasons. Again, these are several photos of the dam being uh, or constructed. This is looking west towards the embankment between Gilbert Lake and the river. Riverside Drive is right on top of that, that ridge now. This is looking east where the dam is today, the concrete dam, and the paper mill would be, or the former paper mill building would be on the top of that ridge. This is a photo by F.J. Haynes. This is nearing the completion of the building of the dam. The original bridge that went along with it to Gilbert Lake. That bridge only lasted for about a year before the log jams were caused by it. They had to move the, the bridge upriver. And then this is the final bridge or dam, the way it looked initially, along with the power plant and a sawmill. It was just upriver. And this is the later bridge. The, the first bridge was cut off because it was causing too many log jams in the river, trying to get the logs down to Minneapolis. Again, the power plant looking down river. All right, so we need to talk about the Northern Mill Company. So in very early of 1892, the Northern Mill Company, with the same group of investors with a couple new ones, uh, was incorporated. And what they did is they purchased all the assets of the Gulf River Lumber Company. The plan was immediate. They were going to take the sawmill and move it to Brainerd. Again, I'm not going to read through all these in detail, but in June of 92, the Crow Wing County citizens approved a $100,000 bond to aid in the construction 
of both the sawmill as well as the Brainerd and Northern Minnesota Railroad. The Brainerd Northern Minnesota Railroad was a standard gauge logging railroad that was built out of Northeast Brainerd. And when it got west of Gull Lake, in many areas it was built right on top of the old grades of the narrow gauge. So the, it absorbed the assets of the narrow gauge, it standard gauged all the locomotives, and then that one was built up to Spider Lake. The construction of the sawmill and railroad began in June of that year. Uh, the Gull River sawmill and equipment were dismantled and moved to Northeast Brainerd starting later that fall. The rail line opened for inspection only six months later, which is unbelievable with the technology that they had to build a rail line that long and that quickly through the moraines. This is a new sawmill in Brainerd. This was built around the equipment from Gull River sawmill. It was a very large sawmill and for its time it was very high technology. They even had a lighted uh, lumber yard, which it lit up the sky at night and it, people were confused about that at first. This is looking from Aaron's Hill. Today, this bridge is actually cut off underwater and the Mill Avenue concrete bridge, the highway bridge, is built right over the top of this. Uh, it's difficult to see, but the roundhouse is right here. Uh, there's two long trestles going out into Rice Lake. The logs that were dumped off those trestles went to the sawmill. The logs that were dumped in, in the Mississippi, those went downriver to, to Minneapolis or other locations. Here's another image. You can see the, the seven stall roundhouse here, the sawmill, the sawdust burner, and then the substantial lumber yards. Note this building here and this one here. We're gonna cover those in just a moment. And this is a great map of showing where the trestles were located in the Rice Lake where they dumped the logs in, where the roundhouse was located, which is behind residential houses today. This long spur here, was the log landing and those logs dumped in the Mississippi, as I mentioned, downriver, mostly to Minneapolis, some to Little Falls. This shows just the main line of the Brainerd Northern Strip down up to Spider Lake. If anyone has ever snowmobiled or taken an ATV north of the County Road 24, Cully, you're on the old railroad grade for the Brainerd Northern Minnesota, from basically here up to Spider Lake. Today, well, let's cover a couple things. So the red line is the old standard gauge coming from Lake Margaret. Narrow. Narrow gauge, thank you, Carl, Cully. The green line here is the Paul Bunyan Trail today. That's the reconfigured line. What has occurred after 18 months of this being in service, they determined it was so expensive and so difficult to build through the moraines and probably had ma major operations issues with cars coming off tracks, track sinkings in the marshes, that they determined it was cheaper to pull back 35 miles to Lake Hubert and build a new line to Walker, which is what the target was, than to continue from 30 miles south of Walker from here. It's just too rugged a country. You can't build a railroad in the moraines. That's why you need the Pillager Gap for the Northern Pacific. So I want to just mention quickly, this yellow line, this was Charles Kindred's Brainerd and Northwestern Railroad that was never built. But had it been built, his survey would have cut off North Long Lake. It would have been shorter North Long Lake and also cut off both the Gilbert Lake branches with probably filled trestles. So it's probably a good thing it wasn't built if you live on North Long Lake. Uh, again, the green line is the Paul Bunyan Trail today and that was the main line for the M&I, the reconfigured survey up to Walker, Bemidji, et cetera. So I mentioned those two buildings in the photos. This is Northeast Brainerd. This is the relocated office building for the Gull River Lumber Company seen here. This building here is a relocated um, housing for the employees. I'm sure they had about 30 people that could stay in here during the, the season of cutting. They rebuilt that board for board in Northeast Brainerd, even the lean-to off to the side. The only thing different is the two little windows here don't appear here, but everything else is exact. Even the chimneys are in the same location. So really, when I say they relocated Gull River, they relocated the equipment, the people, the families, even the structures went to Brainerd. And again, this shows the, um, the large boarding house that was re later re relocated to Bra Northeast Brainerd as well as this building, which is the office building. Again, there's the boarding house in the office building from Gull River. 
More evidence, John, about something later we'll talk about. All right, again, just a couple more photos of Northeast Brainerd. These are things that probably have never been seen before. This is a great view from uh, looking east at the sawmill in Northeast Brainerd. There's the office building again from Gull River Village. And notice how the river is just inundated with logs. This is the logs intended for Down River. These stacks are about 25 to 30 feet tall. This is the line below Riverside Drive and Aaron's Hill. This had to be an extremely dangerous job. As a matter of fact, it was. There's numerous newspaper articles about men losing arms, legs, and getting killed on these stacks of logs, unloading the logs into the Mississippi River here. This is the same view today. This photo was probably taken from the railroad trestle, which today is the Mill Avenue Highway Bridge. And photos of the men on the, on the stacks. This is Aaron's Hill, looking north, and the railroad bridge again today, Mills, the Mill Avenue Bridge is here. And then eventually they built a new office building for the uh, Brainerd lumber, lumber Company, as it was called then, right here. And this building was relocated after 1903 when the lumber company closed on its operations in Northeast Brainerd. It was located to North 6 in Washington. It's still there today. Does anybody know what this building is besides John Van Essen? Yes, it was, it's a sawmill inn, formerly known as Van's Cafe. His grandparents bought that cafe. What year, John? So kind of a blasting grandchild of Gull River Village, if you will. So Gull River Village site today. So in 1910, as all of you know, um, a dam was proposed which became the Sylvan Dam, initially called the Stoner Dam, to produce electricity for the communities on the newly established kind of iron range. It was completed in 1912, and almost immediately, it quickly submerged most of the sawmill site at Gull River Village. This shows the Sylvan Dam down here, the Stoner Dam, and how much it flooded the Gull River up past the Northern Pacific Trestle and the highway bridge. And this is a map of the same, just showing how much wider the Gull River was. This is an image that Doug Burke put together in LIDAR using a blueprint of the town. And you can see this is the mill spur that came off the Northern Pacific. The depot was here. The sawmill is underwater today. A lot of the office buildings, you can see the, the footprints, the cellar indications. The dam for the um, sawmill was here. This is the burrow pit for the, the earthen material. The Cunningham House is here. Uh, there's a story that I had found in a newspaper that a Northern Pacific train stopped here at the depot late at night. It was after dark. And of course, there was no lights then. So a passenger stepped off the train, fell off the bridge, and went into the river and drowned. No, a lot of deaths occurred at Gull River. A lot of very strange deaths, actually. This is another image taken by Doug Burke. This is actually six-foot bolts embedded in concrete submerged in the Gull River where the machinery used to be for the sawmill. Those are still there today. And if you had a big nut, you could probably fit right back on there because they look like they're brand new. This is again looking south-southwest. We showed you this image earlier. This is the same view in 2013 that I took. There is an overlaid, again, the, the highway bridge, you can't see it in the black and white. Anybody have any questions? I do. What was the purpose of the narrow gauge? Did it, could it go through different types of terrain than the wider gauge? It really wasn't about the gauge, it was about the type of locomotives. Because they had gears on them, those geared locomotives can go up 12% grades, whereas standard locomotives, if it got to 2%, it was too much to pull a heavy train and they would just spin the tires. I would say the biggest factor there was the cost of building the grades between a four foot eight wide track and a three foot. You could build that grade up or down where they had to ditch through hills or build up embankments, it was much, much cheaper. Two feet narrower is what you're saying, Kali. So a lot less earthwork. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Any other questions? And I have a couple. Go ahead, Dave. The, uh, where, the, where the mill is located in that picture, how much of that would have been, how much of the mill and the, and the yards and everything would be underwater currently? Most of Just it. Just about all of it. In fact, Doug and I back in 58 and 59 and located the old original sluice chains. They end them where they pull the logs up into the mill. And uh, they were way a ways underwater. In fact, I didn't think it was that deep there, but I think we were at about 10, 12 feet deep. Uh, and most of the foundation lines and everything at that time, you could pick them out underwater. Doug also mentioned that he'd found the dam, the original yeah. dam that was still down there. I would have to get back to you on the capacity of that mill. Um, I've read it. I don't know it off the top of my head, and I don't have it in my presentation in my notes. But I can get back to you, Dave. It's millions of feet. I, just, I don't know what the capacity is daily, but that's something else I've read before. I think I remember they, they, they floated a lot of them down in the spring, correct? Correct. And I think I remember you saying one year, one spring, they floated up like 23 million board feet of lumber, which is pretty substantial at that period. I think I read one time there was 30 million board feet at the landing of Lake Margaret, but then it might actually be low, lower than it actually was. You can imagine they had to take those logs from Lake Margaret, boom them together, take them through the narrow channel at the time, then all the way across Gull Lake. So not only are you taking them, transporting them by horse to the rail line, then the rail line to the water, the water by boom all the way down to the dam, and then you've got to drive them down the river with some river rats to the sawmill. Very, very expensive. That's why it made most sense to move the sawmill to Brainerd and build a new rail line and have it all mostly in one transportation si system. And then uh, a little further on the Cunningham House, I think in one photo you showed on that side of the highway, current highway, there were four or five homes there. Yes, and some office buildings. Yeah, and that was part of the offices and the, and the administrators, I understand, of the mill. Correct. So why is that one the only one that's there? It's barely there, but why is that one still there? Any, any idea? Private property? I don't know. It's a good question. I, I, I did hear and I've read somewhere that after Gull River was abandoned, that one of the favorite things to do was burn an old structure every weekend. <laughs> and before that, when Gull River was in full operation, there literally was a major fire almost every year, almost to the point where you suspect that somebody was setting these on purpose. And I actually have a suspect, but that's something I'm going to reveal later. Because <laughs> he got busted doing it in Brainerd. And he was from Gull River. That will be a teaser for later on. And again, I, I can't uh, have a presentation without again mentioning my good friend Doug. This is a picture of Doug Burke. You've heard his name over and over again through all the presentations. This is an image of him on the standard gauge. Cully was with him that day. This was back in 2000 and fall of 2013, October. And he's very meticulous, by far and away the greatest researcher I've worked with and a very good friend. If you don't know Doug Burke, you certainly know this building if you've been through Pine River. Doug was the man that got this building preserved, saved, and that was really Doug's, one of his strengths, is preserving history. And preserving history isn't just about preserving a landmark, but it's also about rediscovering it and sharing it with people. And that's what I was hoping to do here today. So I really appreciate, again, the invitation, Dave. I appreciate that uh, Sylvan Township worked with the Pillager School Community Education to put these programs together and I, I'm really pleased to see how many people are here. I hope if this goes forward as a program that more students will attend this because I think it's important that they see this and I think they'd actually get something out of it as well besides just looking at their cell phones all day. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>